Good afternoon, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome back to our Freedom School series. We missed you last week, but this week we are blessed to have Dr. Monique Moultrie, who is going to be presenting on her topic, Going to Hell. Uh, shoot. Help me, Dr. Moultrie, please. Uh, I can't remember. Going to Hell for my authenticity, That's existence right. as resistance. Thank you. Sorry, I can't have multiple screens up to see the title. So we have Dr. Moultrie, excuse me, um, all for messing that up in the beginning. Um, but as we start, we will again like to thank Auburn Avenue Research Library for partnering with the Department of Africana Studies at Georgia State University to host these Freedom School webinars, this Freedom School series. Um, this has been a great success for both of the entities involved and we are so pleased to have such a wonderful group of lecturers and speakers speaking with us today. So I will start off by introducing Dr. Moultrie. Dr. Monique Moultrie is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Georgia State University and she was recently a visiting Associate Professor of Women's Studies in African American Religion at Harvard Divinity School. She earned her degrees from Vanderbilt University, Harvard Divinity School, and Duke University. Her scholarly pursuits include projects in se sexual ethics, African-American religions, and gender and sexuality studies. Her book, Passionate and Pious, Religious Media and Black Women's Sexuality, was published by Duke University Press and was the 2018 Book of the Year for the Religious Communication Association. She has published extensively in journals and edited volumes, and her forthcoming research is a study of Black lesbian religious leadership and faith activism. Her research has been supported by Harvard Divinity School's Women's Studies and Religion Fellowship, a Ford Foundation postdoctoral fellowship, Wabash Center for Teaching and Learning Grants, a GSU Dean's Early Career Award, and an American Academy of Religion Individual Research Grant. Outside of the university, Dr. Moultrie was a consultant for the National Institutes of Health and the Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual, National Institutes of Health and the Lesbian, Gay, and Bisexual Organization, Transgender Religious Archives Network. She is on a content development working group um, as a member for the Columbia University Center on African American Religion, Sexual Politics, and Social Justice, and the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice Scholars Group, a group of religious scholars collaborating at the intersection of religion and reproductive justice. Within the larger American Academy of Religion Guild, Dr. Moultrie is the former status of women in the professor chair and a former co-chair of the Religion and Sexuality Unit. Welcome, we are pleased to help you have you today, Dr. Moultrie. Thank you so much. I'm going to share a screen and then I'm gonna do a little setup and talk about what you'll see, so. All right, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm excited to be back with the Freedom School uh, and with the African American Studies Department in the Auburn Avenue Research Library. I, in the fall, discuss Black women's faith and sexuality in a Freedom School conversation. And there, uh, during the Q&A, I introduced this topic, my current research project, uh, which is on Black lesbian religious leadership. Uh, in, that conversation, I set it up by sort of telling you where uh, I am coming from as a researcher. I am trained as a womanist or a black feminist whose research bridges religious studies, cultural studies, women's studies, and sexuality studies. At its core, the bulk of what I do uh, is focused on addressing the moral crises women face as they make choices about their sexuality in societies that often negate their ability to choose. So this current project, uh, this is, I want to say chapter two that I'm presenting uh, from is chapter two of my upcoming book manuscript that's currently titled Hidden Histories, Faith and Black Lesbian Leadership, which examines the oral histories of 18 cisgender out Black lesbian religious leaders, women who are at the forefront of social change uh, within their religious spaces. Most of the interviews that I'm gonna talk about today uh, were of Protestant Christians 
ages 37 to 72 at the time when I interviewed them. Although I diversified the study, so the larger study also includes additional interviews with two spiritualists, a Jewish rabbi, and a Buddhist lay leader. For the time today, though, I'm going to focus mostly on Protestant Christian experiences as I demonstrate these religious leaders' connection to Black church religiosity. So some of you may have watched the PBS special over the month of February uh, that focused on uh, Black church experience, and it did a segue discussion about LGBTQ queer concerns. Uh, and so this research sort of stems into and branches into that conversation. So let us begin. My overall project, while it emphasizes the significance of self-identity and social location as activism, because self-naming for these women is an important tool of resistance and liberation. My focus today is on the commitment to authenticity as I explore this concept of existence as resistance. So when discussing black lesbians and religion, what you see are notions of the historic black church, as well as you notice the concept of the black church needing to be unpacked. Uh, and part of what you see here on the screen are the seven Black Protestant denominations that are what are quantifiably and qualitatively expressed as the Black Church. So we have the National Baptist Convention, the National Baptist Convention of America, the National Baptist, uh, sorry, the Progressive National Convention, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, and the Church of God in Christ. These are uh, important, again, if we're going to have conversations about Black religion, but they're also important because they are the traditions that the majority of my interviewees were reared in before uh, they moved into a denomination that happened to be more welcoming. As you can see here on the slide, uh, none of these traditions are openly affirming and accepting of LGBTQ uh, lives and love. This slide shows a clear depiction of Black Protestant denominations as openly antagonistic to Black LGBTQ persons, such as was seen after the 2015 passing of same-sex marriage, when all seven of these historically Black denominations publicized statements denouncing same-sex marriage. So they can't get together on anything, but they did get together to put out a statement uh, that said that they thought same-sex marriage was immoral. So, the homophobia that that entails is something that I'm not really going to address in this talk. I can do it in the q and A. I'm, I'm certainly happy to offer some insight uh, because I want to focus on uh, these women's experiences, but also because I think the argumentation that goes around with the Black church being homophobic um, is true. It is as homophobic as the rest of society is. But I think this is often because it tends to rely on conservative biblical interpretation as its foundation. And thus, it is going to be conservative. It is going to be um, not welcoming in ways that would be affirming. Yet when Black people discriminate against their own LGBTQ community members on the basis of religious belief, this conflicts with what we have as a cultural expectation of Black churches' historical memory as justice seeking communities. So we talk about black churches as if they are progressive and have always been, uh, when in fact that has never been historically accurate. The reality is black churches are spaces of complicated acceptance for many LGBT persons. And this is damaging for the full thriving of black LGBT congregants who are typically trapped in the space of negotiated acceptance where their gifts and talents are publicly appreciated while they're encouraged to only be privately authentic to their lives and loves. So ultimately my project asserts that the active presence of black lesbians in religious spaces is not an outlier, but rather elucidates the ways in which black women's religious leadership is often ignored and the complexities of their lives diminished. This project taught me the significance of these leaders standing in their truth and advocating for others to do the same. I contend that their bold choice to be publicly out as queer religious leaders is their form of resistance to the many forms of discrimination they faced. For example, pastoral theologian Horace Griffin uh, that 
is where these terms came from. He describes four types of invisibility experienced by Black lesbian Christians, namely guilty passing, where lesbians feel they are sinful and deserving of the rage imposed by heterosexual church members. Angry passing, where lesbians publicly deny or remain silent about their own sexuality while expressing rage and condemnation for other gays and lesbians. Silent passing, where lesbians publicly deny or remain silent about their sexual attraction and are not active in their religious communities. And finally, opportunistic passing, which is a scenario where lesbians have accepted themselves but feel they cannot come out or speak out against homophobia. Rejecting these models of passing and choosing to live freely is a private decision that has public consequences. These black women, religious activists are examples of persons who resist, subvert and redefine black faith and culture. In the same way that Sister Audre Lorde speaks to all of the interviewees that I spoke with were comfortable with the term lesbian although some use queer or same gender loving depending on the context. This shouldn't be especially surprising given the similar age ranges of my subjects with most being in their mid fifties uh, at the point in which I was interviewing them. But my focus on out black female religious leaders was because I wanted to look at the audacity and their hyper visibility in spaces that have historically and purposely not recognized black lesbians as worthy of documentation. So this project is a retrieval uh, project as much as it is a project to talk about ethical leadership. Self-awareness of one's sexuality as non-deviant in a society that has deemed black, black sexuality deviant is a monumental task. Historically, women and blacks were deemed sexually loose, making black women doubly condemned for their gender and their race. The importance of leading an authentic life was one of the central themes presented by all 18 of the oral history participants, reflecting Audre Lorde's notion that being an open lesbian is a courageous and subversive identity. For the remainder of my time, I want to take up this interest in authenticity and authority by introducing you to five Black lesbian religious leaders. You're going to hear directly from uh, Reverend Deborah Johnson, Elder Darlene Garner, Reverend Naomi Washington Leaphart, Reverend Katina Washington Leaphart, and Dr. Carrie Jackson. I'm going to offer some introductory uh, biographies for each of these women and then incorporate their own words into my discussion of how important authenticity and agency is to womanist ethical leadership. So we begin here with Reverend Deborah Johnson. And I realize the print is very small, so I'm gonna read these quotes out to you. Uh, Reverend Deborah Johnson is the founder and president of Inner Light Ministries, an omni-faith outreach ministry dedicated to teaching the practical applications of the universal spiritual principles. She's also the founder and president of the Motivational Institute, which is an organizational development consulting firm specializing in cultural diversity. In addition to being an author and instructor, she is also a founding member of the Agape International Spiritual Center in Los Angeles with Michael Beckwith and serves on the leadership council of the Association of Global New Thought. She was a successful co-litigate in two landmark civil rights cases in California, including one that set precedent in the state civil rights bill and the other that defeated the challenge to legalizing domestic partnerships. Ooh, I just lost my Zoom light. Hold on, everyone. That's what that loud sound was in the background. This has been my, the story of my week, y'all. So bear with me. Here we go. So I conducted my interview with Reverend Deborah in October of 2017. More so than any of my other interviewees, Reverend Deborah included in her life narrative clear historical markers, perhaps because of our presumed age difference, or perhaps to remind future generations that the long arc of social transformation that made possible her being her authentic self. Despite there being nothing overt in her Pentecostal upbringing, paving the way for her to be free, to be out and fully recognized in the world. She described her long held hope for a marriage between my idea, and I'm quoting her, of being able to just be okay 
you know, and be accepted and respectable and not a second class citizen or second tier. And if I had to make these environments myself, so be it, end quote. Reverend Deborah had been out at an early age having the same girlfriend from the 10th grade through college. But she recalled being strictly punished for her boldness by her parents who forced her to undergo shock therapy and threatened to cut her off financially if she was publicly a lesbian. The vignette here on the screen is her realization that resistance started with telling the truth even when it had dire consequences. She says, so it's this triple whammy I have the law saying I'm a criminal, the church saying I'm satanic, and the psychiatric association saying I'm sick. So I really felt like I didn't have any other choice. It was like fight or die. So my activism was really about saying, you're wrong. All of you are wrong. I don't know how I knew, but I just knew. And in my mind, I could see a day. It was almost like the slaves that could see freedom. I mean, I could literally see a day when it would be okay to be open. I could be proud. I really could be in a relationship. The world would accept me. I wouldn't be a second class citizen. It was so real to me that I was willing to fight for that. So for me, it was kind of peeling away at it. My theology had to change. But first I had to literally in my mind be willing to go to hell for my authenticity. And that was the conclusion that I came to around 14 or 15, that if there was a hell that I was gonna have to go because if I lived the life they wanted me to live, I'd have been in hell here and still had to go to hell because I knew who I was, end quote. From this difficult act of resisting her parents and their expectations, she went on to find solace in the religious science community where she felt free to be her complete self and have that self be embraced. Yet Reverend Deborah was quick to note that despite being in a racially and religiously mixed environment that is good on racial diversity and LGBT, Q issues, the challenge for claiming her agency in that space was in assisting new members and adjusting to the more inclusive environment. She said that most lack skills in interacting with such levels of diversity, especially with lesbians of color in positions of authority. It is because Reverend Deborah had learned to accept her full self that she taught others to authentically merge several of their unique identity categories. While most of the interviewees told of periods of their lives when they felt forced to lead a compartmentalized life in which some of their identities could not be expressed, all eventually came to the conclusion that Reverend Deborah did, that bifurcation was not the path to authenticity. Most of the women that I interviewed were in leadership positions in predominantly white settings. Though they experienced discrimination as deeply intersectional, they acknowledged that in these settings, they were often viewed by their race first. Those leading in predominantly black spaces faced obstacles based primarily on their gender. A few noted that either they were expected to de-emphasize their gender or their lesbian identity in their predominantly black organizations. Among those working for queer organizations, some commented on feeling the need to downplay their religious leadership or on finding themselves in religious institutions where either their queerness or their femaleness presented challenges to how their authority would be received. As one interviewee noted, these challenges resulted in a deep compartmentalization that left her unwoven with her strands coming apart. That interviewee is my second case here, Elder Darlene Garner, who was a longtime leader in the Universal Fellowship of Metropolitan Community Churches or MCC, which was the first Christian denomination to serve the spiritual needs of the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgendered community. She served as a pastor of several MCC churches and founded the MCC Conference for People of African Descent, Our Friends and Allies, in 1997. After decades of leadership, Elder Garner retired from ordained ministry in the MCC in 2018 at the age of 69. Her interview highlighted both the damage she experienced from compartmentalization and the fulfillment she, left, she felt from living a whole life. Elder Garner was my very first interview conducted for the LGBTQ RAN archives in 2010. In this interview and follow-up conversations, Elder Garner emphasized the process of coming out as a coming into self-awareness. She recounted the feeling of coming home when she arrived at Metropolitan Community Church, Washington. And she was an active member there from 1976 
until her publicly forced retirement in 2018. It was in this religious space that she grew in leadership, but also in the awareness that she needed a more integrated life. She says, and I'm quoting, I was a member of MCC of Washington, DC and with my three children, had a really busy time as a member of the church, just kind of immersed myself in new theological discoveries and learned how to fully embrace myself as a beloved child of God with no need of shame for being a lesbian. It was a wonderful time of self-discovery and discovering new things about God. But one of the realities that I faced at the time was that as a black woman, it felt as though I had to choose between being black and lesbian. And so when I look back on that particular time in my life, I say that I became unwoven. My strands all came apart. So there came a point when my social community shifted from my being in a lesbian social community through primarily MCC to working with six others to form, to found an organization called the National Coalition of Black Lesbians and Gays in 1978. And I decided that I would never again allow anything to cause me to leave any part or piece of myself, that I would engage all of it. I would enter life from a place of wholeness, not a place of brokenness. And no one would ever come between me and myself, my whole self. And that's kind of the way I've lived ever since, end quote. As she grew in ministry, she felt her calling to the MCC instead of the predominantly black unity fellowship movement was a result of her desire to lead a life of integrity and to do so in a community of diversity, one that she called a manifestation of heaven on earth. As the highest ranking African-American in the denomination, she recognized that being the first spiritual leader of African descent meant a responsibility to make sure that she wasn't the last leader. After four decades of leadership within MCC, she was passed over as the denomination's next moderator, rumored to have been ousted for calling out MCC for wavering on its commitments to diversity. This painful example of authenticity was particularly striking because for her and others, living authentically had cost them tremendously. While I had not expected the benefits they found or particularly the joys they recounted, they did all note that they would find help for others by advocating for their own authenticity. This was especially the case for my youngest interviewees. And this is one of those persons. These next two are of a couple, both faith leaders who placed the premium on living authentically so that they could amplify others' voices and urge them to live holistic lives. Reverend Naomi Washington Leapart is the director of faith-based and interfaith affairs for the city of Philadelphia and was formerly the faith worker director for the National LGBTQ Task Force, the country's oldest national LGBTQ justice and equality group. She served as a co-pastor of St. Peter's United Church of Christ in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where she was the only openly queer licensed minister and African-American at the church. She was ordained by the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries and the United Church of Christ and as an adjunct faculty member in the Theology and Religious Studies Department at Villanova. I interviewed Reverend Naomi in 2019, and she was my youngest interviewee at 37 years old. She spoke of answering the call to ministry as an act of authenticity and an act of doing no harm. When I asked about her coming out story, while at seminary, she responded in a way that signaled her decision was about more than just living her truth. While in seminary, she recognized that she had to live fully in order to advocate for others to do the same. Bolstered by mentors like another interviewee, Bishop Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder, who told her that she could tell the truth and survive. She connected this understanding to public ministry for social justice organizing. She had grown weary of grassroots organizing where she was only able to advocate for certain parts of her identity as she acknowledged that she sort of became a little disillusioned about the extent to which she was going to be able to be authentic and actually fight for the people who need justice. When she transitioned to working for the National LGBTQ Trust Force and eventually the city of Philadelphia, she was able to leverage all of her identities to work on behalf of others. While acknowledging that her blackness was a primary identity for her, this does not re reflect a fragmented self. On the contrary, she insists, and I'm quoting her. I think my queerness and my womanness sort of work together. What does that mean? 
I, as a black woman who loves another black woman, like I think there's something that really shapes my sense of self. A black woman who loves another black woman who's raising a black girl. We're always talking to them about what it means to be womanish, to love deeply and fully and unapologetically, to let your yes be yes and no be no. That deeply shapes me, end quote. This communal understanding of personal identity reflects philosopher Charles Taylor's theorizing on the ethics of authenticity. In Taylor's off-sided definition, he determines that authenticity is self-definition in dialogue, as he rejects what he calls self-determining freedom as individualistic and even selfish. In Taylor's understanding, our authentic selves are formed in community and our moral salvation comes from recovering authentic moral contact with ourselves. Both notions of authenticity are held simultaneously and this is represented in Reverend Naomi's query of how she could advocate for others when she was not ready to publicly advocate for herself. Not surprisingly, her wife shared a similar re realization. Her wife, Reverend Katina Washington Lee Park, was the former director of programs for reproductive justice and sexuality education at the Religious Institute. She began her ministerial career as a chaplain in both healthcare and clinical care settings. She identifies as a queer womanist follower of many paths, including the way of Jesus, and volunteers her time in greater Philadelphia, community organizations that work on maternal child health and faith. Jointly ordained and married with a teenage daughter, she and her wife, Naomi, Callings complement each other as they work side by side, though in different spheres of ministry. Reverend Katina placed a high value on authenticity and even delayed her ministerial or ordination in search of another more excellent and authentic way, end quote. This path forward would not require her to mute any part of herself to fit in. And at her ordination, she noted that in the fellowship of affirming, affirming ministries, all of me is welcome here. All of my queer self, my black self, my woman self, my charismatic self, my contemplative self, my multi-faith sensibility self, my intellectual scholarly self, my questioning doubting self, my faithful sure self, end quote. The comfort in having all of these identities accepted in her ordination also shows up in her ministerial and professional commitments. In her role as chaplain for Presbyterian Homes, a retirement community in greater Chicago, she was not out at work. As her pastoral team's only black person and with only one queer staff member, she did not feel com sufficiently comfortable there to be out. But the need to be out became more pressing. In her oral history interview, when I asked her to signal which of her identities was most important, she said she realized that so many of her identities had shifted over the time that to lift up one seemed kind of erroneous, that she learned through these shifts that she was all of these things at all of the time. Part of what she recognized as living faithfully was also her uniting her work on herself with the work for justice in the world. She uses her privileges, her experiences to be a social justice leader. Yet she shared with me the need for boundaries, showing an awareness of how she wants to live and show her faith. The final interviewee that I wanna speak about is Reverend Dr. Carrie Jackson who was a pastor, counselor, and organizational consultant. She had pastored congregations in three Christian denominations, the United Church of Christ, where she was ordained, the United Methodist Church, and the Presbyterian Church, USA. She has a PhD in Christian ethics from Drew University, an MDiv from Union Theological Seminary, and a JD from the University of Maryland. She currently serves as the executive for religious leadership and advocacy at the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. Her interview was one of those most dedicated to the value of authenticity as she connected the importance of rejecting compartmentalization with helping advocate for others to live holistic lives. Dr. Carey's life reflected the sage wisdom of someone who had prevented burnout by rejecting stagnancy in positions. She is constantly being called to serve in places that are predominantly white with persons who don't think that they're racist or sexist or heterosexist. As exhausting as that seemed to me, she felt that this was a gift to those communities because of the value she places in being her authentic self. While she could consider herself an outsider, she says those experiences taught her to just be me, to be authentically who I am. 
They also increased her commitment to reject compartmentalization. She says, what guides me, and I'm quoting, is most is that I talk about authenticity. I'm authentically all those things, clearly being a woman, being black, being dark skinned, being someone who is shaped in a working class context. All of these things are inextricably who I am. I really can't tweak them apart. I can say at the core of it is spirituality. For her, her work of authenticity is individual and communal. She needs to show up as her whole self so that she can help bring others to the same realization. She holds a firm belief that, and I'm quoting her again, our families, our societies, our world are better. When individuals live their authentic selves, it is my hope that everything I do helps nurture a firm authenticity in others because there is benefit to the individual and that benefit then has reverberating effects in all of society. This belief in the universal value of authenticity is what struck me particularly in the oral histories of these religious leaders. All of these women were examples of exercising resistance to the many types of oppression that seek to render them invisible and unheard. This represents for me, self-determination as agency or existence as resistance. And identifying as black lesbian leaders who had a ministerial calling my interviewees often felt conflicted within their various boundaries set up to keep them in their place. Thus, the women I interviewed were creating and crafting their own holistic selves while simultaneously creating alternative avenues for others to imagine their own lives. When I interviewed Reverend Deborah, she noted being proud that she had survived without succumbing to things that would make her unhealthy. When she made the decision at age 14 or 15 to go to hell for her authenticity, she could not have known then how her life would unfold, but she was unwilling to live a lie. During her 2017 interview with me, she noted that she had done the forgiveness work to love and accept herself, recognizing that so many people are thwarted by this task. This reminded me of Black lesbian Cheryl Clark's determination that it was time for Black lesbians to, and I'm quoting her, love ourselves, as that is the final resistance, end quote. This call to love and acceptance contains a theoretical position that allows their very lives to become theory. Thus my research project is ultimately about taking this first action of loving oneself, reading into that bold audaciousness, which is an affirmation of Alice Walker's definition of womanism. Walker's multifaceted definition identifies a woman as, as a woman who loves other women sexually and or non-sexually and who loves the folk while loving herself. These interviews with black lesbian religious leaders overwhelmingly revealed women who recognize their full selves as gifts to their communities and the self-awareness or womanist authenticity fueled their continued support for thriving in their communities. This also reminds me of womanist ethicist Stacey Floyd Thomas's theory of radical subjectivity, which she explains as the process by which black women come to fully understand their own agential power to resist oppression. While Floyd Thomas's theorizing depends on biomythography to speak to black female experience, my research relies on living texts, actual black women as valid data to illuminate sites of resistance. Thus, this research builds on the various theories of womanism, such as black feminism, being concerned with women's culture and faith and maintaining a communal anti-oppression orientation, demonstrating how their womanist leadership styles can teach others values like agency, liberation, wholeness, justice, reciprocity. I discovered that their lesbian identification often triggered a cooperative and holistic justice style of leading that I find instructive for other leaders. My research offers a womanist ethical leadership model patterned after their stories that emphasizes leadership strategies that are non-hierarchical. They don't focus on just one solitary leader. They're peri-institutional. They involve more than just one religious community. And they tend to be intergenerational, including leadership from persons of varying ages, which allows for leaders at any stage or age of life. Ultimately, they're examples of shared leadership structures, coalition building, and social justice activism are lessons, I believe, for religious and secular leaders. So if you're interested and wanna know more about any of these women, these five that I've given, 
uh, here on the screen is um, a screenshot of the website uh, where all of this data is found, LGBTQ Religious Archives Network. Uh, and thank you for listening and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Moultrie, for the wonderful pres and, and very informative presentation. Um, if you have any questions, audience, please put them in the chat box or in, or in the Q&A box um, for any questions that you may have for Dr. Moultrie. Um, this was powerful, and I definitely like how you framed it and conceptualized you know, their stories and their existence um, as a method of resistance and for them choosing to embrace themselves and their, and their identities, um, regardless of how people have tried to marginalize them. And I think even your research of, and the methods that you use of interviewing them allow, is a further act of, of resistance and giving them voice to people that have been um, historically marginalized and, and not having voice specifically um, within the Black community as well as within the Black church. And we continue to see examples of ways in which um, voices are marginalized within our community or as Kathy Coyne would say, sub-marginalized um, within our community as well. And so my first question for you <clears throat> is that you gave background details on, on, on these women and their um, leadership positions and their roles in various churches. Um, did they have, or did they mention in their interviews any struggles that they've had with churches until they found um, the place where they felt like they can live most authentic, authentically? Oh yeah, but none of these churches get it right. Um, even, even the ones that they've migrated to. Uh, and that's what I found uh, so endearing. Um, because they were truthful about that, that there wasn't a perfect union anywhere. Like Elder Garner, she found in MCC, like she thought this was the manifestation of heaven on earth. Like it was all this diversity, it was, you know, all the things. And then they kicked her out. And, you know, they, they, she was uh, about to retire at age 70 and um, thus earn retirement income from the church. And mm -hmm. they basically retired her uh, mm -hmm. without retirement salary at age 69. Um, and, and this was a long time coming because she had been agitating uh, that uh, the, the choices that they were making as far as representation of their leadership structure, the highest echelons of their leadership structure were getting wider and wider. Um, and she was vocal about that. So every one of them, uh, the ones that were uh, participating in black denominations. I interviewed Tanya Rawls, uh, who was one of the first black bishops of the Unity Fellowship, which is the first black uh, gay affirming denomination. And uh, she, as the first female was like, yeah, we totally weren't ready. Like we thought we were good. And you know, we were all the things because we'd overcome the like bad theology about our gayness. And we had you know, done the work but we hadn't done the work. Like they were jacked up about gender. And so her being a female bishop was like really a problem. And she found even in her own congregation, she's now transitioned her community from unity to a UCC church. And uh, she said one of the catalysts for that, one of the reasons she wanted to make that move was uh, that she needed space to be I'm more fully expressive about all the needs, all of the human needs, not just LGBT needs, but she also felt that, um, that the transgender experience within her own community was like her own blind spot. That she, she jokingly said, you know, we have trans members and we say, you know, girl, you're looking fierce today, but like we never talk to them about what their lives are. And so some of these women are performing sex work before they're coming to worship. Um, they are, are housing and trans and transient, you know, they have food insecurity, uh, but we don't get to, down to that. Um, and, and she recognized that as a, as a problem that she's currently, you know, still trying to address. So yeah, e each of them showed great resilience um, and, and time and time again, uh, the ability to say, okay, we thought we had a model. Now we see here's our missing piece, let's work on it. Uh, and so, they continue to do the work. Um, and, and I think the closest that I've seen that comes to like someone 
that gets it right is what uh, Bishop Yvette Flunder is creating with the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries. And again, this is still a collection of like humans. So, you know, there are still human leaders who are apt to have their own frailties and uh, failures, uh, but they at least um, they as a tenant, a core tenant of being in an affirming ministry, they have to practice what she calls radical hospitality. And this radical hospitality really is about making sure that everyone is represented at all times in all aspects of their leadership and all aspects of their worship service and all aspects of the day-to-day -day of how their congregations run. Uh, and I, I think that gets us closer to what uh, they're all aiming for. Thank you. So we have another question from the audience. So can you speak to the rising LGBTQ leadership in the Episcopal, Epis, Episcopal Church? <laughs> They've been increasingly inclusive, also engaging in racial reconciliation. The pre presiding bishop, Bishop Curry, officiated Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's wedding. Yeah, so the Episcopal Church was one of the first to sort of get on board. The Episcopal and Presbyterian churches were um, some of the first to get on board with LGBTQ uh, clergy uh, to ordain uh, clergy. They were less on board with same-sex marriage, but they got on board um, more quickly than other denominations. So certainly there, um, that, that is a space that is, has been um, historically seen as more open uh, and affirming for persons. But I will say it has not always been seen as open and affirming for uh, Black LGBT persons. And uh, the, I don't know, something about that intersectionality of identities, um, it, 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 you can find a space that's good on one thing, but like atrocious on another. So you can find a gay affirming, lesbian affirming congregation that is horrible on race or, you know, vice versa. So um, I've, I've seen that, I've noticed that, but I do think it is one of the bright spots. I, I think if, when I'm looking at denominations to like point folks to, um, I tend to point people to UCC, um, the United Church of Christ, uh, their covenants, uh, they were, again, the first to come out on um, same-sex marriage. They were among the first to ordain uh, gay clergy, lesbian clergy. Uh, they've been uh, really clear and had clear and affirming statements for trans persons uh, and talking about uh, the need to advocate against uh, discrimination in our policies. So I would point there, but yeah, I, I do think uh, the work that is being done in the Episcopal Church is worth noting and it's worth uh, taking a look at. A look at. Uh, but all of these things don't happen in silos. So these communities, as they're getting right on racial reconciliation, also have to get right on racial reconciliation and LGBTQ reconciliation as well. Yes. Thank you. And I think some of the underlying views that we saw in, in what I saw in all of your um, the quotes that you had from the interviewees is this idea of intersectionality, right? And how prevalent it was in impacting their whole self, their authentic self and, and encompassing all of that. And they all pointed to the fact that they did not encompass just one identity. So thank you for that. Another question we have is what does the black church as an institution lose when women like those centered in your research are pushed to the boundaries? That's a great question. Because when I first started the research, so the book, the first chapter kind of looks at the scholarship, like the lit review. And so there have been um, books that have been written about Black lesbians. And there's books that have been written uh, about Black gay experiences in, in religious institutions. Uh, there's much more written about Black gay men than there is about Black women. And some of the notable authors, Horace Griffin is one that I, I included the quote from, they just outright assume that like they're Black lesbians are shunned and are, are not a part of the religious tapestry of the religious community. Uh, and, and Griffin, he points to uh, the like blues woman as like the, the way lesbians were treated, that they were seen in the same light uh, as blues women were treated. So they were seen as deviant uh, in some way. Um, and 
I've always pushed back against that one because, you know, I just did this whole study with lesbian religious leaders and churches tend to follow the structure of their leaders. So churches that are led by women tend to be predominantly female churches. Churches that are led by men also tend to be predominantly male churches uh, within the LGBTQ community. You also just see in general in black churches, black churches are predominantly female. There is a much smaller number of black male participants in religious spaces. While they are hyper visible in religious leadership, their participation in the pews is much smaller. So it's baffling to me why there's assumption that in a space that is predominantly black female, there would not also be a large number of black lesbians. Like it just like doesn't make sense. Uh, but that's what the scholarship has pointed to. Um, the, the scholarship that is out here has has reiterated. And so my research wants to one, respond to that and say, you know, hey, let's take a, a broader look. But I also think to um, more poignantly um, answer the question, part of what I've also seen um, in doing this research is that the way in which Black lesbian leaders are leading is often obfuscated, often overlooked. So the work that they're doing to provide housing, to provide you know, medical assistance, to provide just general care for their community, that's all deemed women's work. And it is not given leadership status. So sister so-and-so is a good servant of Christ mm -hmm. is what it gets spoken to. Um, and sister so-and-so is the one who's you know, writing a CDC grant. And sister so-and-so is the one who's like running the 501c3, but that is not who gets the line, the title as the leader or the executive director. Um, so I don't think that we're losing their input. I think we're overlooking their input. And what that does then, I think where I find that deficit is that for future generations, it opens up great angst because you have to see what you want to be. You have to see um, women uh, in authority to imagine that you yourself can be in authority and be taken seriously and, and, and do a good job. And so when we don't highlight the fact that they are working and that they are um, killing the game, like when we just don't acknowledge that, it impoverishes the future of these spaces. I would then, my, the final point I'll say on that um, great question is that I also think that institutions that tend to highlight this one model of leadership, what we are losing, and this is continual, it's not just a past tense or present tense, we're losing the ability to have sustainable religious communities. So there's all of this crying out about, oh, the millennials, the black millennials, you know, are, are less church than, than our, their previous generation. Well, the data actually, the newest Pew data that's out says, well, in fact, black millennials don't leave their communities. They may not go actively, but, you know, when, when they're surveyed, they still claim, you know, I was raised Baptist, so I'm Baptist but they don't attend anymore. They, they may now go to a non-denominational space or they're you know, now a non-denominational space and they practice with an ephah priestess as well, that they're mixing and matching. Um, and what I think we're losing because we don't acknowledge these um, extraordinary female leaders is the ability to have a sustained generational religious community where one generation can share lessons to another generation uh, because that millennial and Gen X and Gen Z, et cetera, those communities have just discounted it and said, oh, the church isn't for me. They're not gonna accept my queer friends, so I'm not gonna go. And that's erroneous. I, I think in fact, many do accept their friends, but uh, that isn't the popular or the recognized um, opinion. And so they just stop attending when they're out of their parents' home, um, when they enter the college stage, and then you see them come back when they have their own children. Uh, and they're, they're then looking for spaces that are all the things that they thought they couldn't find. So they're then looking for these uh, spaces that are queer affirming, that are you know, led by women that have youth in ministry, et cetera. Um, and, and, and for me, that's gonna be a, a real loss uh, that won't be well, won't do well for the continuation of black church. Thank you. 
Um, we have another question. Um, so that previous question was from Dr. Jonathan Gills and the question before that was from Professor um, Ashley Salmon and she has another question for you. So can you also speak to the experiences of black lesbians in the progressive Christian movement? Has your research found this space to be truly affirming and inclusive of black lesbian church leaders? So I'd wanna hear more about what she is calling the progressive Christian movement. All right, let me see if I can give her access to actually talk. Ms. Salmon, you now have the ability to talk. So if you unmute yourself, you can ask your question directly. Thank you. Um, so the first question was mine. The second question is actually my fiance. So I'll let her ask it. Uh, <laughs> hi, so I have been, uh, I guess, getting, becoming more aware about the progressive church move, uh, Christian movement, I guess, in terms of um, the deconstruction, decolonizing uh, church movement. I don't know if you've like heard about it. It's mm -hmm. supposedly the fastest growing uh, Christian movement now in the United States, but it's been a space that has been widely uh, lauded as a uh, place of inclusion and a place of um, affirmation for all peoples. And I was just wondering if you knew much about um, if, you know, Black lesbians have, if, in your experience, have spoken to this, you know, even hearing about this space, because how can you call yourself the bastion of inclusion if you're not, you know, including Black lesbians? So I was just wondering, in your experience, have people spoken about this movement? Have people, you know, uh, given you any experiences with it? Uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I wanted more clarification because uh, every generation has a new progressive Christian movement, something that they're calling progressive Christian, and, and it's the newest fun, you know, the newest, biggest trend um, out there. Um, in fact, you know, the, Martin Luther King broke from the National Baptist Convention to create the Progressive National Baptist Convention uh, because he felt like their tradition wouldn't move. So every generation, I think, does have this um, reiteration of we're doing it, we're doing things differently. Do I think what I've seen from the progressive Christian movement space, I, from what I've seen, this is, at least from what I've seen, and this isn't my research area, so I'm just going off of, you know, what I've read in Christianity Today and that kind of thing. But what I've seen is this is a space where dejected evangelicals are going. So persons who grew up um, in evangelical communities who now um, have queer friends or queer themselves or who um, are now interracially dating, who've got you know a couple of multiracial children, uh, that they're looking for a space that they can go to together uh, and they're not finding it. And so they're seeking um, to, to create this space. And that's what I've been familiar with. Um, within within that term, with within that movement, uh, do I see it as particularly inclusive of Black lesbians? I mean, anything I think that's started by whites is generally formatted for whites, and we are included and welcome to come to what they've already planned and what they've already set up the agenda for. So uh, as much as the agenda is, you know, one of the churches, I think it's United Methodist Church that has like the, the motto, open doors, open minds. So like, yeah, it's open. We're telling folks, you know, come on, anybody come on. And except if you're queer, you know, we didn't mean you. So that you get to these spaces and open has already been defined by the people who get to make the definitions. So that's, that's my gut response. I probably need to do a little more research though. To give, to give a more informed response. But that, that's what I'll say at the top of my head. All right, thank you okay. very much, Dr. Moultrie. Uh, thank you for your responses. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you being, for being a two-time Freedom School presenter, lecturer. You are our pro at this. We love having you. We, also, we always learn so much. Um, and so thank you so very much for this. Um, before we end, is there anything, I know this is your new research and you're currently working on a book, so is there anything else that you would like to share with us that you would like to um, promote? <laughs> or, or yeah. 
discuss? Absolutely. Um, I, I wish I I wish I'd thought of this before. I would have had the the link up. The um, newest project. So I'm finishing up this project. This book goes into the press May first. So this this one is just about done. Um, but the new, new research project that I'm working on is a project on Black child free women and faith. So I'm looking at women who are purposely choosing not to parent and what their faith community messages are about those decisions. Are they being affirmed? Are they, how are they negotiating those faith spaces? So I've been doing focus group interviews with uh, participants. So if you know any black child free women who are you know, interested uh, in talking about that experience, I am a black child free woman uh, and um, part of what the pandemic brought to mind uh, my my aunts were very afraid for my safety because I didn't have children. Like who will take care of you if you get COVID? Like who's gonna make sure they pull you off the vent? Uh, and so I've been really fascinated and interested in uh, conceptions of family and uh, legacy for black child-free women and what faith communities have to do to support them. So if you know anyone who fits into that category, uh, send me an email. Okay, and can you tell us your email again? Yes, it is mmoultrie at gsu.edu. Yes. All right, I put it in the chat. Um, again, thank you. And you know, you are always welcome to come back. I hope this gave you um, some release and all the good feels that you needed for this week. And um, we're sending you love and hugs and everything. And um, we hope you continue to take care, um, both you and your family. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, our next Freedom School is next week and it is Dr. Gonaskar Muhammad or Dr. Goldie Muhammad. And she is going to her um, Freedom School talk is entitled Cultivating Genius and Joy and Equity Framework for Culturally and Historically Responsive Education. Um, same day, Wednesday at 7.15, same time. And on April the 7th, that is the week of Easter. So we will not have any Freedom School lectures that week. So we'll have another week off before we come back. So again, thank you. Thank you all for joining us and thank you for your continued support. Have a good night.